Welcome to St. Peter United. My name is Martise Harper, and we are excited that you are here and joined us for services on today. We have a special message for you, and it is just for you. God loves you, and he loves us all. Here at St. Peter, we welcome all in whatever you are in your stage in life, on its journey or passing through, we are here for you. St. Peter stands on the understanding that God is love. And we love the fact that you've joined us on today. So please join us as we go now live into service and give God praise. And he gives us life. Our scripture reading today comes to us from the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke chapter 24. The Gospel of Luke chapter 24 start, starting at verse 36. Luke 24 starting at verse 36. So in your Bible app or in your pew Bible or on the screens, you can go to Luke 24. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. If it is your custom to stand, you may do so if you would like. Luke 24, starting at verse 36. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Somebody already getting started. You don't get me going this early. I'm trying to, I'm trying to. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. Somebody say touch. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet Yet, Scripture says, for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. They were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, to change the subject, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. I would like to have requested some catfish, but they gave him a piece of fried. Uh, they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to talk to you this morning about believe it or not. Believe it or not. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us all now the eye of the eagle. Help us to see into our hopes, joys, fears, and sorrows. Collectively weave our hands to the gospel plow and tie our tongues to truth. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing your grace. Let us hear from you the still speaking, ever living God in our midst. This is the, our prayer in the name of our ancestor and savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you have not had an opportunity yet, I advise you to go back and see the Easter sermon uh, because it tied really well into what Shelley taught us last week. Shelley taught us that the power of fellowship and how we rise together is intricately connected to the development of our belief and our faith. She said those activating elements of faith and transformation are fellowship, Affirmation, inspiration, and hope. But where we are going to tie in and connect this week is when she said something that literally snatched the rest of the hair I have left off of my head. She said, seeing is not believing. Seeing is not believing. This week in our scripture, we see that Jesus is among the disciples, and yet they are still in disbelief, and they are wondering, they are they're really not sure that this Jesus 
that was crucified is also this same Jesus that is showing up in their place. Can you imagine someone dying and coming back to life and asking you for something to eat? I took a look at this. It said disbelieving is, disbelieving is the feeling or the expression of disbelief. The dis that comes before the belief means to be apart from or asunder or away or utterly having a negative or reversing effect on belief itself. Belief is an acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists or trust or faith or confidence in someone or something. This belief is not something that they had in Jesus when he showed up in front of them and said, see, you can even feel the marks and the wounds in my hands and my feet. And if that was not enough, they were also wondering. So not only did they not believe, but they were also curious. Thankfully, they were curious enough to stay there. If they had not been curious, they would have done like many of you would have done if you would have thought somebody came back from the dead. You would have... And you know how it is when we see one person running. <laughs> That's, uh, all right, let me stop. Belief is the opposite of disbelief. And the awareness is the opposite of wonder. Belief in the resurrection of Jesus was not even possible for them after he had healed the blind, healed the lame, restored relationships, flipped tables at the temple after everything that Jesus had done and convinced them that the kingdom of God was among After all that Jesus had done, they were still standing there in disbelief. Was it not enough that I healed the blind that you cannot believe that my God would have raised me from the dead? Yet they were still in disbelief. They did not have an awareness of his power and trust behind his ministry. They had forgotten everything that was done. You would think that belief and awareness would be based on a memory, remembering all of the evidence, all of God's power, everything that God had done amongst them as disciples. But we know even as they journeyed with Jesus, they still had their disbeliefs and doubt. So I turn to us today. What are we disbelieving? What are we disbelieving about ourselves, the good and the bad? Are we disbelieving that, yes, God has brought us this far? Are you disbelieving that God has blessed you with an amazing family? Are you disbelieving that God has blessed you with an amazing spouse so you argue with them all the time? Are you disbelieving all of the blessings and the grace and the mercy that you have experienced in your life? Are you disbelieving all that has come before? Are you disbelieving that it's, if God has done it before, that God will do it again? As I said last week, we only doubt God when we forget what God has done before. Do you have an awareness of God's greatness in your life? Do you have an awareness of all the bad that may be occurring in your life as well too? Are you stuck in the disbelieving and awareness doom loop? My message for you today ties in with what Shelley said last week. And I don't know that this makes much sense to you, but it made a whole lot of sense to me when I received it. Tangibility does not equal feasibility. Feasibility. Tangibility does not equal feasibility. 
What do you mean, Pastor? When Jesus was going about healing people, if he had to wait for a small shred of tangible evidence before a miracle could happen, then the miracle would not have happened in the first place. If Jesus had to wait on a little bit of tangible evidence for something to be feasible, then the miracles wouldn't have happened in the first place. If Moses had to wait for a little bit of tangible evidence that the Israelites would be delivered from Egypt, there would not have been the possibility of them getting out of slavery. Tangibility does not equal feasibility. Well, let me bring it closer to home. Tangibility does not equal feasibility. Perhaps you have worked on a degree and graduated with an undergraduate degree before. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I kept thinking was, I don't even know how I'm going to get through the first class, much less the second class. I don't know how I'm going to get through the fourth class, much less the fifth class. But there was something in my mind that helped create the feasibility. It was the idea of, I will walk across that stage. I will have a higher pay. I will finish it. I carry in my body the legacy of all of my ancestors. I will finish this no matter what. But if I had to wait on some tangible evidence that I could, because all of the statistics said I can't. Perhaps tangibility did not equal feasibility when some of you got ready to buy your house. Some of us started out six to 12 months before buying the house and said, well, I don't think it's feasible for this 500 to get up to 625. Come on, somebody. I'm telling the truth. Somebody in here, has, somebody has a background somewhere. It was not feasible. It did not seem tangible. Yet in your mind's eye, you saw yourself walking around the house. You saw yourself having a more. You saw yourself doing something that was not going to be possible. Shelley quoted Eric Buttermore last week. She said, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. You see things not as they are, but as you are. You see things not as they are, but as you are. And that got me to thinking. When we see things, we create an interpretation about the things that we see. So our eyes will actually see something and then we will be, we'll begin to form a narrative. We will create an interpretation. We will create a perception based on our culture and life experience. Oh, you thought you were seeing something and that was really you interpreting. No, but it's based on your life experience and culture. Here's an example. You're sitting in a cafe in Paris. Let's do this. Let's do this up. You're sitting in a cafe in Paris outside, and the passers-by, I've always wanted to say that, the passers-by are traversing the promenade. Oh, I'm, I'm doing it. The passers-by are traversing the promenade, and you see them moving on their way. And then there's a couple that's holding hands and what do you think? They must be in love. Because culture and your life experience sees that and interprets and perceives that they're in love. When actually they were just leaving the therapist and they're considering getting a divorce. You see, what culture and life experience has taught us is to interpret what we see in a particular way. Some of y'all can't be on Facebook because you think everybody is living a good life and you are not. But I know some folks on Facebook that look like they're living a good life and I know what's backstage. And backstage all the props and costumes are falling apart. What you see it's not always reality. We have really ventured over the last few years to really try to push 
positive thinking and affirmations in order to change our mindset and to change how we view things. It, it's, we're doing it because we're trying to, to get all of us to see that we have tapes and narratives that we need to write over so that we can build a better belief and build a better faith so that we can better understand God and move beyond all the boundaries and limitations that have so beset us. But so many of us have struggled with positive thinking. I know because I struggle with it myself. I'm a Virgo. There's always, come on, Rashad, you know, we talked about this the other day. I, nothing, nothing is ever good enough. I can tell you right now, there's a light that is not angled the same as the other one on the other side of the sanctuary. It has annoyed me for a couple of years now, but glory to God, there are lights. I can find dust in the dark. But I always tell people it is any strength overused becomes a weakness. And so if you know you are prone to negative thinking and always looking at the risk side of things, it's good to know somebody else that can talk you out of that. But here, here's, here's why we reject positive thinking. And I love this. This is from uh, Brianna Wiest, 101 Essays That Will Change Your Life. She gives three reasons. She says, one, we see positive thinking as naive. We falsely associate negativity with depth. And so to be aware of the negativity or to be unenthused or unemotional or passive is also to be cool. This is why we think of the cool kids in school as not caring so much. You know, having this idea of go with the flow, everything's fine. Who get Two, we're constantly reinforcing our subconscious belief in the negative. The very nature of personal belief is that which experience has proven true to us. This is impossible, she says, however, when we are subconsciously seeking out evidence to support the negative ideas we are constantly entertaining. And on that one, I want to hang a lot of this. In other words, I have said we've been trying to shape our belief by using positive thinking, but we are trapped. Our culture does not allow us to embrace it because once a negative thought or idea is there, we're addicted to dealing with it. We're so addicted to dealing with it that we begin to magnify it and make it bigger than what it needs to be. One philosopher said, thoughts held in mind multiply and repeat after their kind. So the challenge is, if you are trying to create a more positive experience, perhaps you should invest as much energy in thinking better about yourself, thinking better about your life, than investing a lot of energy into, I don't have this, I don't have that. Why does she have that? Why is he going there? Why do they have so many followers? Why do they get to buy Ferragamo and Gucci? Why do they get to drive a Mercedes? Why do they get to... If you would focus more on the positive and the great that God is already doing in your life, those thoughts would repeat after their kind. We cannot move beyond disbelief and shape our awareness without creating a positive frame of mind. The last one she says is we are more inherently fascinated by the negative in the world because we do not understand it. Because we do not understand the purpose or the reason for the pain, we find it unknown and mysterious, therefore more crucial to attend to. We're fascinated by the intensity of something we don't understand, so we end up fueling it more and more simply by paying attention to it. Dick, <laughs> negative posts get more like. What does the news say? If it leads, it bleeds. I don't know. I don't know, Brandon. I don't want to talk, but that, you know, that is what y'all say. Okay. If it, if, it, if it bleeds, it leads. That's the saying. One of the things that I've been working to do over the last few weeks is, um, so I'm a little addicted to um, news on my, my Twitter. I mean, Twitter is just, it's all news. I know some of y'all use it for other things, but it's all news. It's all, you know, you know I'm going to tell it. It's all new, a lot of news. And I also like watching several different um, 
news stations. And I will put it on and watch them pretty much all day. I'm working and I'm listening and I'm working and I'm listening. And a few weeks ago, it's like Spirit said to me, there's a lot of negative in the world. You're sitting here infusing your writings and your thoughts with everything negative that is happening in the world. I will encourage you to also think about what music are you also listening to as well. I don't want to judge any of it. If it twerks and works for you, then fine, it twerks and works. But, but what, what are you infusing your mind with? Because it is writing a tape, it is writing a narrative that will shape your belief system. Everything that we are attempting to do here is to move us beyond just a place in believing that we can into a place of accepting the faith that all things are possible for us. Napoleon Hill, another one of my favorite philosophers, he wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich. He said, repetition and affirmation of orders to your subconscious mind is the only method of, vol of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. In other words, repeating what you want and desire in your life, repeating what is true and good in your life, is the only way to develop some sense of faith around your identity, some sense of faith around the job you want. So whatever it is, the only way to develop the faith that is necessary for that is for you to develop your subconscious to build up that faith. But unfortunately, the negative messages from mama and them and the negative messages from the church before and the negative mess messages about people that said that you couldn't and the negative messages I'm not small enough, and I'm not big enough, I'm not tall enough, I'm not, uh-oh, black enough, I'm not, uh-oh, white enough, I'm not Mexican. Whatever the message is, you have somehow built up a faith in those ideas. And the only way to undo those things with another faith is to subconsciously communicate to, to yourself the positive thing about yourself and what it is that you desire. You are cute enough. You are good enough. You are the size you need to be today. You may have a whole lot of warmth you can provide, or you may need a whole lot of warmth from somebody else, but you are exactly where you need to be today. Napoleon Hill also says, faith is the basis of all miracles and all mysteries which cannot be analyzed by the rules of science. I'm probably one of the only preachers that'll teach you this. Yeah, you have faith in Jesus, but do you have faith in yourself? The faith that you place in Jesus, do you have that same faith in yourself? Do you believe that God is working all things out for your good? Do you believe that you deserve the love that you have in your life? Do you believe these affirmations that we have hung up on these walls? Do you believe the good in yourself? Have you told yourself, I love you? recently. What do you say to yourself when you look yourself in the mirror in the morning? Napoleon Hill tells the story of Abraham Lincoln, and I didn't remember this from when I read it before. When I was looking at it last night, I looked at this, and he says, Abraham Lincoln was a failure at everything he tried until after the age of 40. Can you believe, black folks, that your freedom came from somebody that was an utter failure until after the age of 40? Can you believe this person signed the Emancipation Proclamation? Yet you're sitting there saying to yourself, I'm too old. God is done with me. There is nothing left for me. Yet Abraham Lincoln was past the age of 40 when he finally began to do something successful. Mahatma Gandhi had faith in the, free, in the freedom of the Indian people, and he galvanized over 200 million people because he had an idea of liberation. 
He had no money. He had no fame. He had no resources. He didn't have Twitter. He didn't have Facebook. He didn't have Instagram. None of that existed when Mahatma Gandhi began to set out for freedom in India. Yet, here today, many of us love the victim narrative. And that is what we have ultimate faith in, our victimhood. Oh, my life is so hard. Oh, my life is just so, girl, can you believe my mama and them? Oh, girl, can you believe what's going on at my job? Oh, can you believe what's happening over at, over down at the country club? Oh, can you, you ought to be glad you have a mama. You ought to be glad you have a job. You ought to be grateful that you can afford a membership to the country club. Your life is not so bad. What is the better positive narrative that you can tell yourself? Sitting around being a victim is going to continue to create an experience in which you are a victim. Every time you complain, every time you say it, you create your experience. You build up a faith in the negative that is in your life. In other words, you are dis believe in your possibility and aimlessly wandering through life with no faith in yourself. God does not specialize in the easy, I heard a preacher say. God specializes in the divine. God specializes in the divine. God chose a barren woman to give birth to a prophet. God chose a boy to kill Goliath with a rock, no less. God chose a backsliding preacher to go to Nineveh. God chose a century-old man to give birth to Isaac. God chose a virgin to give birth to Jesus. When it is hard, God does best. God specializing in moving in difficult situations. God specializing in dealing with things that are not easy. And all the while, you thought your narrative was very unique and you were the only person in the world that was suffering and going through anything. But in the midst of all of this, God specializes in exactly what you're going through. Furthermore, God has already provided the answer to get you out of what you need to get out of, but you have built up a faith in your victim situation. So until you get your mind in gear, your ass is not going to follow. I remember, I don't know if you remember, years and years and years ago, and now this has become a really big thing, but uh, there was something called Ripley's Believe It or Not. And they had all these fascinating images and stories and things, and, and it would say, you can believe it or not. And that's what I stopped by to say today. You can believe it or not. You can believe that God is on your side or not. You can believe that you need faith in yourself or not. You can keep disbelieving and wondering, or you can move to a place of faith, belief, and acceptance. You can start believing, as I believe it was right, said Fred, said back in 1992, you can start believing that, yes, you too are too sexy for your shirt. You can start believing, I might mispronounce this, what Keeley said back in 2003, yes, your milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. Oh, I'm getting too secular. Let me switch it to churchy terms. You can start believing that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Or not. You can believe you are worthy of love. Or not. You can believe you have a purpose. You can believe that you are accepted by God. You can believe that the best is yet to come. 
You can believe that the steps of the righteous are ordered by God and you see the evidence of God's goodness. You can believe that nothing shall separate you from the love of God. You can believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You can believe that God is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not, one translation says, be shaken. You can believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can believe that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but one of power and of sound mind or not. You can believe that I am fearfully and wonderfully made or not. You can believe that I am loved with an everlasting love or not. You can believe that I am blessed to be a blessing or not. You can believe I am strong and courageous because God is with me or not. You can believe that I am chosen and appointed to bear fruit or not. You can believe I am led by the Holy Spirit into all truth or not. What you choose to disbelieve may be the very thing that you need to be believing to get out of the situation that you are currently trapped in. God, 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 God. I love that scripture. I said it. That all things work together for our good. All things work together for our good. Losing a loved one, you may even wonder how does that work together for our good? But it is evidence that God has so strongly showed up and loved you and blessed you with someone so amazing that you get to share and pass that love on to someone else as well too. So in all things, death, life, struggle, adversity, divorce, chaos, terminations, all things are working together for our good. God is already turning around situations, reordering relationships, raising up people to help you, bringing peace in the chaos, and turning your grief into gratitude. Break the doom loop of disbelief and wonder. Let's all activate our faith and our gratitude because we can believe it or not. Thank you.